Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Style. Um, I know him for a while. I know him since he and I were both uh, independently working on getting Linux to boot on the Intel Macintosh hardware when nothing else ran on the Intel Macintosh hardware. And he beat us to a punch. He was the first one to do it. And he's an interesting guy. He's, he's a kernel engineer for uh, a Fortune 500 company. And uh, he does all kinds of hacking, and a lot of it is just incredible. So he's, talk, he's going to talk about one of those things today, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Michael Style. Um, I founded and I am maintaining the Xbox Linux project. And uh, in this function, I um, participated in lots of the hacking that was going on. Not in all of it, because we started a bit late. Um, but um, I know quite a bit of what has been done on that. Um, as you know, 24 slides a second, that will be a flicker-free picture, so I will have many, many slides, um, and I'm going to talk really fast because I have lots of information, because personally, there's nothing more I hate than talks that don't have enough information. Okay, let's start. Whoa. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just kidding. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, let's start with um, a quotation of Bruce Schneier. He read um, a paper I wrote about the Xbox security system, and his comment on it was, lots of kindergarten security mistakes. So the question is, is the Xbox security really that bad? Is it that uninteresting? Is it that badly, badly done? Or, um, well, I, I can tell you it is interesting, but does it really um, include so many mistakes, so many obvious mistakes? Therefore, we are going to look at it from Microsoft's point of view. We will be constructing the security system now. And then you can ask yourselves whether these mistakes that have been made by Microsoft, have they been obvious? Would you have noticed? If they are obvious, then Schneier is right. And um, yeah, lots of kindergarten security mistakes. And if they are not obvious, then maybe it's not that trivial to construct a security system. So let's start. Um, <laughs> now we are Microsoft. We want to create a gaming console, a video game console. How do we do that? Now imagine it's uh, 1999, and within two years of time, we have to release a gaming console. So what do we do if we want it cheap and we want it fast? We take PC hardware, we take Windows 2000 software, we all have this already. We take the DirectX libraries and put it in a small enclosure so that it looks nicer. This is fast, this is cheap. The problem is that marketing has to make sure that the press doesn't see it as a small PC but sees it as a real gaming console because people associate all bad things with PCs like long startup times or instability. So what came out of this was some Celeron processor, um, well, not too much RAM, a GeForce, it even has a hard disk, DVD drive, fast Ethernet, USB, and as an operating system, it's based on the Windows 2000 kernel. So it really is a PC, or in other words, today you could say the Xbox is also a Mac, because a Mac is a PC. But what actually makes a PC? Is it, if you have an Intel CPU and have an x86 compatible CPU, is it already a PC? If you have VGA style hardware, not necessarily. What about all these technologies? Do they define what is a PC? Certainly not, because Sun hardware, SGI hardware also has all these technologies. But the point is, the Xbox also has the old um, 1982 interrupt controller, the old 1982 timer, and even IBM's A20 gate hack. All these legacy components can be found in the Xbox. So if it is a PC, shouldn't it be trivial to run anything on it, like Linux? Um, we want to prevent that. We, as in we are Microsoft, because um, with a security system, we, d we don't want people to run Linux on it because um, the, the Xboxes are sold at last and money is made with the games, so people shouldn't buy them and run uh, Linux on it and use them in a cluster or something. Uh, homebrew software is a bad thing, trademark-wise. Copied games are a very bad thing. And also unlicensed games, because money is made with the games and Microsoft gets a fair share of these. So we can address all these four threats against our strategy with the Xbox with a single security system. 
This, the idea of this security system is obviously to run only authentic code on this. So we have to choose which code runs on it and every code that is not authorized by us may not run on the Xbox. So um, execution may only be passed from one part of trusted code to the next part of trusted code. This is called the chain of trust which reminds us of what the industry has been after for quite a while and what, which is still interesting right now, which is trusted computing. Um, so the Xbox, in a way, implements these trusted computing principles and takes away control from the user and leaves all control to um, actually Microsoft because they, only they have the keys um, to authorize software to run on it. So how does this chain of trust work? At system startup, we must make sure that the Windows kernel, which is stored in ROM for faster boot up times, um, will, uh, is authentic. It, it must be checked whether this is the authentic kernel. And then the Windows kernel, in turn, must make sure that the game is authentic. And there is another check. The game can be from hard disk or from, D from DVD. How can we implement this first one from startup? Right on startup, only authentic code may run. Um, let us look at the Xbox hardware. Now I have, I happen to have one here. Ah. If you want to have a closer look at it, I'll pass it around. This one is a bit broken, all the chips are missing. I turned it in for warranty, but they wouldn't accept it. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's for those th who can't see it right now, you have it on the slide that this is a standard PC. You have um, a CPU there, which is the Intel Celeron 733 megahertz. You have an NVIDIA Northbridge with integrated GPU. That's exactly what they sold as the Enforce One chipset as well. They have a South Bridge there. Um, there's RAM, 64 megs of it. And there is Flash, because computers tend to boot off some ROM, which is typically Flash. Um, this is how x86 systems start. Um, at the bottom of memory, there's RAM, and at the top, there is flash memory. And an x86 starts from this address. This is the uppermost address of RAM minus 16 bytes. And this must reside in flash or somewhere to make the machine go. Um, typically, this looks a little like this. Sets up the CPU and jumps to some other location, to the beginning of flash, for example. Um, but a hacker could easily just modify the flash or put their own code there and then just do anything with the system what they want. For example, run a hacked version of the original Windows kernel that will allow copied games, for example. So how would a hacker do this? Let's look at this, um, the main board again. One thing is they could just replace the flash chip. It's a chip there. People could um, just put a socket in and uh, have their own flash chip there. They could also um, override the flash chip because this is a, a, an interesting thing. Um, it is better to uh, put empty flash chips onto the board than boot them once in the factory from an external flash chip and flash the internal chip. That's a lot cheaper than having them pre-programmed and put them in. Therefore, we must have some override functionality so that it can boot off another bus. So we need this bus for manufacturing purposes. And of course, we must make sure later um, that nobody else could use this functionality. And the third possibility is, of course, to overwrite, to reprogram the flash chip, because it is writable. So flash might not be such a good idea. We just cannot start directly from flash. What possibilities do we have? Possibility one is we don't start from flash. We put a ROM chip in there. ROM is expensive, um, but yeah, it, it buys us that it cannot be reprogrammed, but it can still be replaced. Um, that override functionality is also not necessary because it is pre-programmed. We don't need that functionality, but it can still be replaced. So not a good idea either. Another possibility is to put the ROM chip inside some other chip or flash or, well, it's, let's say it's ROM, put it in some other chip. And then, um, this is very effective because nobody can replace it anymore unless they want to replace the whole CPU. But there's no point in that in a cheap gaming console that will be more expensive than the whole gaming console. 
uh, but also it will be expensive for us in manufacturing because we cannot use off-the-shelf Intel Celeron processors, but, have, but we need custom processors. Also not a good idea. But there is a compromise um, between these two ideas, which is put a small ROM chip somewhere. We'll talk later where. Maybe not in, through the CPU, but in another cheaper chip. Um, this small ROM chip is, um, is quite cheap to put in something if it's just like a K or so of memory. And this ROM chip will then verify the contents of Flash and pass execution to Flash if um, everything is OK. This is effect both effective and cheap. Now, this is what this looks like. We have some secret ROM integrated into some component, which is half a K of memory um, at the very top of the address space. It overlays the flash region, so when the CPU starts, it will start in, um, in our secret ROM and not in flash. It can then uh, in, uh, verify the integrity of flash, and if it's OK, pass execution to there. Um, now the question is where to put it. The CPU is expensive because the CPU is the most expensive part in the system and custom ones, um, that's not a good idea. Um, Southbridge would be great. The Southbridge is the cheapest chip but it's still fast. Data will travel over a bus because the CPU has to, um, to read the instructions from the ROM in the Southbridge but this bus is really, really fast. It's hypertransport and we're talking about 2001. Uh, nobody is able to sniff data this fast. Well, almost nobody. Uh, and let we just put other um, other ideas in there so that even if it gets sniffed, nobody can do anything with it. Just let's be on the safe side. Okay, but the problem with flash verification is um, checking and um, having a, a signature, an RSA signature with public key cryptography, just does not work in 512 bytes. Uh, you cannot fit uh, RSA in there. Just checking a hash, that would fit in there. But if we just had a hash, then the kernel could never change. So as long as we manufactured the same um, south bridges with the same secret ROM, we would never be able to update the kernel in later revisions of the Xbox. So what we do is we introduce yet another link in the chain of trust. We have a second stage bootloader, the 2BL, which gets hashed by the secret ROM. The secret ROM only needs a hash, so the 2BL cannot change. But the 2BL does nothing more than verify the kernel with an RSA signature. OK. So what does the secret ROM have to do? It has to verify the 2BL for integrity. And it has to pass control to the 2BL if it's OK. Um, what also would be a good idea to decrypt 2BL. So if 2BL is encrypted and also the kernel is encrypted, then any attacker would see nothing but um, ciphertext in the flash. So they have no place to start hacking. But for decrypting, we have to initialize RAM because the decrypted contents have to be stored somewhere. And we really have to initialize RAM. It doesn't work when we start because Microsoft chose to ship even bad RAM chips which couldn't do the spec and which just couldn't do the 200 megahertz. So they get clocked down um, to up to, I th uh, down to, I think, 180 megahertz. So some games don't run that well on every Xbox. But these chips are cheap, so we have to do a stress test and see how fast RAM goes. But then again, it won't fit into 512 bytes if we have to do this RAM initialization. What we can do is put all non-security critical code outside of the secret um, ROM and put it in flash. But of course, this cannot be x86 code, because if we um, call some x86 code in Flash, an attacker could just overwrite that with their own code and um, never return them. Therefore, if we cannot put x86 code there, that's one of Microsoft's greatest ideas, was um, use a virtual machine. And I actually think that is a really good idea. On the right, you can see how this interpreter uh, looks. It's not all of it. It has instructions like memory, like memory accesses, hardware accesses, and some control flow um, instructions. So um, you cannot exit this virtual machine. So an attacker could init initialize the hardware differently, but that's all a hacker could do if we do our job right. Um, the bytecode is called the X codes. I'll refer to them as the X codes in the future. 
So memory initialization could look like this. In Xcodes, we set um, the memory speed to 200 megahertz, then write something to memory, read it back from memory. If it's OK, then go to end. Otherwise, um, try 5 megahertz less, and so on. That's what that can do. Um, now, if a hacker has access to the virtual machine or understands the virtual machine, but maybe no, doesn't have the whole secret code and the decryption and the keys yet, um, an attacker might still already benefit from that. Therefore, we must make sure that an attacker cannot exploit the virtual machine somehow. If they write X codes, because they're not verified for integrity, there's just no space in these 512 bytes to verify them as well. Um, and of course, they have to be flexible for future versions of the Xbox. So when people hack the Xbox interpreter, there are several possible attacks that we have to think about and that we have to prevent actively when writing the virtual machine. That's one of the attacks. Um, the, virtual, um, the secret ROM is at the very top of memory, so that's this address. We could just use the X codes to read the secret ROM, all of the secret ROM, including the keys, and um, send them to some low-speed bus, like the LPC bus or even the I2C bus, which is on the Xbox. Uh, we must prevent that, and that is easy by just masking the high addresses. And this is the assembly code that does that. It just clears the upper four bits if uh, we do a memory read, which is okay for hardware initialization. We don't have to read from there. A second attack would be to turn off the secret ROM. There is a functionality in the Xbox to turn off the secret ROM because as soon as the Windows kernel is running, the secret ROM must be turned off because if there's um, some vulnerability in a game, then the code, the exploit code, the shell code that would run could read all of the secret ROM and there, there go our keys. But the X codes may not turn off the secret ROM. Um, otherwise, secret ROM would just disappear and execution would fall down into flash. So we have to check for this code as well. We compare just this simple poke command, and um, we just do nothing in this case. OK, that was the virtual machine. Now let's talk about the encryption. We don't have that much, much space. We just have half a K of um, instructions. So um, there is a possibility to combine hashing and, and, and decryption. Let's look at um, stream ciphers. We have a secret key. This secret key gets expanded to um, a seed. This seed will, will generate um, a sequence of pseudorandom numbers, and these get XORed with the stream of ciphertext so that we have the resulting plain text again. Now, one great thing you can do about this is you can feedback the decrypted data into the seed. So every time, um, so, so, so in case one of these bytes, one of the ciphertext bytes changes, also the um, resulting plain text changes, the feedback makes the seed change and all the uh, future um, pseudorandom numbers will also change, so the decrypted text will change as well. So all we have to do to get a hash is look at the last few bytes. As soon as something has changed in there, the last few bytes will also have changed. So we can decrypt and hash um, in one by just having that feedback functionality. OK, so um, with just perhaps 100 bytes of code, we can do these two things. There's one more thing that we really have to do, which is the panic code. What happens if the flash tag fails? Uh, we have to panic. We cannot just turn off the Xbox, which would, would be the safest thing. We have to keep it turned on and blink some LEDs to tell the user that something is wrong. Um, the CPU has to be off, but also the secret ROM has to be off. Otherwise, if the CPU is off but power is on, someone could attach some sniffer device and pretend they are a, uh, a CPU and read the secret ROM. So we have to disable secret ROM and hold the CPU. But that is a big problem. That's the same problem as crashing a car while the motor is off. <laughs> because if you turn off the CPU and then turn off the secret ROM, well, who would do that? <laughs> if you first turn off the secret ROM and then the CPU, where would that code come from? So there is a possibility. And that was a really, really great idea of Microsoft. I, li I, love, I really love this idea. We drive against the top of memory. 
This is the very top of memory. These are the last few instructions of the secret ROM. They prepare turning off the secret ROM, and the last instruction, this out instruction, actually does the turn off. And after this instruction, it will drive against the upper limit of memory, and this will lead to an exception, a double fault, and the CPU will be halted. <laughs> I find that a really, really great hack. Now, this is the summary of how the uh, whole security system in this uh, first step of verification works. Um, the interpreter um, interprets the initialization X codes, which are in flash. Then the 2BL gets decrypted and hashed, gets jumped to, and 2BL then decrypts and checks the curl and jumps there. This is what the code looks like. You're not supposed to be able to read that, but um, you should have an impression how much code it is, and it's not all that much code. It would fit on one piece of on, on one sheet of paper, and the, it shouldn't be too hard to um, eliminate all bugs of that. So the Xcode interpreter is pretty large. We have some CPU setup code. This is the decryption code, and of course, at the end of this, there's the panic code and some more panic support code in the middle. Okay, this is what Microsoft thought. Now, we are hackers. <laughs> um, speaking of hackers, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, that whole hacker culture. Maybe that's not what hacker culture really is, but many people think. Let me show you a few pictures of typical hackers. <laughs> That was us meeting in Berlin. As you can see, most of them have, have degrees in computer science or so. It's, um, they're pretty fine people. Three more people that I don't have a picture of, especially Visor. I have no idea who he is, but he did great com contributions. OK, so let's start with Bunny. Uh, Bunny is the great Xbox hacker because he started it all. He did the first um, extracting of the secret code. So first, he looked at the Xbox. He saw there was flash ROM. So he dumped the flash ROM. He put it on his website. He got a call from Microsoft. He put it down again. <laughs> Act two. He did an analysis on the flash that he had. Um, of course, he knew that the Xbox uh, or any x86 CPU would start at the top of memory, minus 16 bytes. He looked there. And what was there? There should be nothing, because the upper 512 bytes of flash are unused, because secret ROM that he cannot see will be mapped there. But what he saw was this. <laughs> Someone made a mistake there. Well, it wasn't that bad, because it turned out that this is not the actual code. This was an old version of the code. But somehow they linked it there. Um, Bunny found out that this was not the real code. He put his own code there, and the Xbox just behaved the same. So it was an old version of the secret ROM. It had different decryption. It had different keys. Um, the Xcode interpreter was slightly different, and um, it cannot be used to decrypt anything. So he moved along and tried to find where that secret code was, because he, he was sure that there must be some secret code somewhere. And he uh, built this small device himself, and sniffed hypertransport. Bunny can do that. <laughs> yeah, and he had the secret ROM. So he had the actual virtual machine, the actual Office C4 decryption, the panic code. He had all of that. But um, how does this help us? Because the second stage bootloader is hashed, so we cannot just change the second, uh, uh, second stage bootloader. What can we do? So let's look again how this decryption and hashing works. Maybe there is some attack there. This is um, how it's supposed to work with the RC5 cipher. Now, the problem is uh, Microsoft used the RC4 cipher without the feedback. So without the feedback, if you change one byte of cipher text, the resulting plain text byte will change, yes. But there is no feedback, so there, the key stream will not change from there on. And the last few bytes will just remain the same. Um, RC4 cannot be used as a hash, but they try to. They check for the last few bytes whether they are authentic. 
the reason why they did it was, as I think, um, they used RC4 in the beginning. RC4 behaves like this, uh, RC5. RC5 does behave like this. And the old version of the secret ROM that we had from Flash worked like this and did it correctly. But they updated it to RC4 for some reason, and yeah, they broke it. So there was no hash. We had the RC4 key. It is in the secret ROM. Um, we had no hash, so we can just encrypt our own stuff, put it in there, let it decrypt. Um, the 2BL check will not fail. It will just succeed, and our code will run. So great. People did that. That was before the Xbox Linux project actually started, um, and made mod chips. Mod chips with um, just replacement ROM chips, which had different software on, on them, hacked software that could run copies of games. The first generation of mod chips um, disabled the onboard ROM by shortening something and added just a ROM parallel to the onboard flash chip. Then people found out that when disabling the onboard ROM, the Xbox would default to booting of an external ROM on the LPC bus. So everything they did was pretending that the onboard ROM is empty by grounding a single data line. Um, it, um, and it will boot off these nine wires, and you can easily attach a mod chip there. So after half a year, uh, when the Xbox came on the market, there were already mod chips with nine wires, which were really, really easy to fit. But for Linux, that wasn't that great. For Linux, we had to find something else, because we just cannot ship the RC4 key with our build tools. We would have to re-encrypt our bootloader. And that's just um, not a good idea to ship that key with our tools. So we had to find a better way. And if we look at the secret ROM again, perhaps there are some other attacks possible. Let's look at the panic code again. I told you I love this, but the question is, does it really work? Does it really double fault at that location? That's also what Weiser wondered. Well, the Earth is a sphere. Yeah, memory is also a sphere. So what happens if you go over the upper boundary of memory? You might start at the beginning of memory again. It's just the 30 second address line that is unconnected. So what if memory really starts at zero again there? Weiser, that hacker that I know nothing about, um, thought that it might roll over to zero. So he wanted to put code at zero and let that check fail to make the system panic. How do we put code at zero? That's, that's RAM. We cannot put code there. We can put code in Flash. We cannot put code in RAM. Yes, we can. The X codes can write into memory. And the X codes are not verified. We can just add two extra X codes which write this jump instruction at zero. So it would look like this. We have these two extra instructions which definitely reside in memory. So does it work? Yes, it works. It does not crash. It just executes that. That's a big, big backdoor. But why? Why did this happen? And that's the greatest story, a short history lesson on why this happened. Let's look at old ancient processors. Let's look at x86 uh, 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 style processors. They start from the top of memory, as I've said. And there are other processors which start from the bottom of memory. ROM must be at zero. But the x86, the original x86, had a great feature so that it could boot both of the top or of the bottom, depending on how you wanted to configure your system. Because if you had a memory setup like this, on an x86 system, then the unconnected region there would read back FFFF, which is NOP. So it would r roll around to zero and execute your ROM residing at zero. And this is something that still the Pentium 3 does and the Pentium 3 Celeron. But why did Microsoft not know about this? There are data sheets that say that. Um, the point is, Xbox prototypes had AMD CPUs. <laughs> and they switched to Intel the very last minute, and AMD CPUs don't have this behavior. And they did not check again. So AMD CPUs do halt on this transition. Well, there might be another hack. It's just 512 bytes of code, but there are several vulnerabilities in there. 
we looked at this instruction, which is supposed to turn off the secret ROM. So code would fall down into flash. The interpreter would be shut off and execution would um, go on in flash. This is the code. Again, it compares this single value. But if we look at the data sheet again, we see that there are several reserved bits. And these bits don't do anything. So we can just poke any value up there. These eight bits, we can use anything. And they get, do not get caught by this compare. So yeah, we can do that. Um, in order to exploit this, we have to prepare landing zone. Um, underneath the secret ROM with lots of knobs and a jump at the end. And this, whoa. <laughs> Is it me? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So um, if this code gets executed and hits that single instruction that turns off the secret ROM, and the secret ROM goes away, execution falls down, lands in the knobs, and executes our own code. And that's not the only attack. This is another way to put it. They, they, they didn't catch it. OK, now Microsoft has to react. Um, these hacks have been published. And Microsoft um, saw RC4 is no hash. They finally understood it. So they reacted. Now the question is, how did they react? <laughs> how did Microsoft react to finding out that RC4 cannot be used as a hash? A, complete code audit. B, fix the hash. C, wait for more attacks. Or D, do nothing. Now I'm going to ask you, um, I'll, I'll ask the audience, who, who, who would do A? Mm, oh, that's quite many people, perhaps a third. Um, B, fix the hash. That's more people, almost half. Um, C, wait for more attacks. <laughs> One. Um, do nothing. One. OK. So they fixed the hash. And I'm not saying that this was a good idea. I'll tell you later what would have been the right thing to do. OK. Microsoft saw that RC4 is no hash. RC5 is not an option. I don't know for what reason. Maybe licensing, maybe some other reason. So they added another hash. But they didn't have any memory left, just a few bytes. They needed a tiny hash. <laughs> they needed, uh, well, many encryption algorithms can be used as hashes. So what they needed was a tiny encryption algorithm. And what do you do if you're looking for a tiny encryption algorithm? <laughs> Google helps. <laughs> You'll get T, T the tiny encryption algorithms. I have no proof that it really happened like this, but it seems somewhat obvious. They fixed the secret ROM. They kept RC4 for decryption. They added a T hash, which is really, really tiny. Um, they updated the RC4 key because it's trivial to update it. Well, they knew that Bunny could just dump the f everything again. But if there is a hash, they are secure. They trashed thousands of uh, Southbridge chips. That's why NVIDIA had a really, really bad quarter two of 2002. They had to throw away lots of these chips with the integrated ROM and make new ones. Obviously, it was Microsoft blamed that on NVIDIA, and they had to throw them away. It was their loss, not Microsoft's loss. OK, let's hack them again. Yeah. Yeah, that was in the Southbridge chip that NVIDIA did. NVIDIA did the Southbridge and the Northbridge. Actually, it was AMD technology. NVIDIA licensed that. So why was it Microsoft? Sorry, why was it NVIDIA's fault if Microsoft shipped them the code? I don't get this. I don't get it either. Um, I don't know why NVIDIA had to had to trash the chips. Because Microsoft. Because Microsoft and NVIDIA. Yeah. But it was NVIDIA who had the losses. So let's hack, again, hack it again. It should be trivial to extract that ROM again and find out whether there are some other attacks possible. We could have let Bunny do it, but we preferred to do it ourselves. Now, now that's the Xbox Linux project. That's where we started. There is an easier way to hack all this. And there is some legacy functionality in x86-based CPUs that you might have heard of. 
that's really, really old and bad legacy stuff that nobody would need anymore today, but it breaks lots of things. Um, it broke many bootloaders. Um, the Intel Macs also have it, and it broke bootloaders. A20, the A20 gate. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it. Therefore, a short history lesson, part two. The 8080, that's mid 1970s. <laughs> The 8080 had um, 64 kilobytes of RAM. The 8086 had to be somewhat compatible to that. It also had 16-bit registers for addresses, so pointers could also or, or only be 16 bits, although it had a whole mag of RAM. So they um, had segments of 64 kilobytes each. They could have done it this way by just having 16 segments, but they chose to have a segment register which was 16 bits wide, so segments could actually overlap. So at the beginning of memory, if you are at segment zero, you would have this segment and 16 bits, um, 16, every 16 bytes a new segment starts. Um, there's a one interesting side effect about this, uh, that at the top of memory, this is actually the last segment that you could use, but it's not the uppermost um, segment number that there is. If you go one step beyond that, then memory, well, that segment will go into nothing. And let's even look at the last one. Yeah, but it doesn't go into nothing. Of course, it wraps around, as always. We've learned that already. So if you have this segment, then um, you will get 16 bytes of the top of memory and 64K minus 16 bytes of the bottom of memory again. Um, because if you add this and you leave away the 20th address bit, you'll just have um, zero again. But when the 286 came out, on the right, you can see the same calculation with the 286. That is different. The 286 is incompatible because the 286 could address 16 megabytes of memory, so that didn't have the wrap, wrap around. You could really address that memory, and Microsoft used that with the high memory in MS DOS. The 286 was incompatible. It doesn't wrap around. So IBM added a hack because there was software that relied on this. There was software who wanted to have a segment that was halfway up and halfway down. Intel did not implement this hack, IBM did, because Intel didn't notice it. But IBM did when they constructed the IBM AT. They added an option to their um, systems to have the, the 20th address bit always be zero. And that looks like this. The 286 is connected to RAM with its address bits. And um, the 286 keyboard controller happened to, be, happened to have a spare pin left. So they connected that spare pin with a 20th address line to pull it down to zero if code wanted to do that. So the, P, the, the AT booted off with, with that hack enabled and software which wanted to use more than one megabyte had to disable, uh, had to enable the A20 gate. Yeah, this emulates the wraparound. Um, effectively, all addresses are ended with this value. Ah, someone is seeing where this is going. All x86 CPUs still have this functionality, including the Pentium 3 Celeron. Even the Itanium has it. So what we did was connect that line, which is now a pin of the CPU, uh, to ground. All addresses get ended with this value. So the CPU does not start anymore at this address, but at this address. But where is this address? Where would it start from? Normally it starts from the top minus 16. Now it should, um, and there's the secret ROM. And now it starts from somewhere there. But what is there in address space? Mirrors or flash. It is mirrored over 16 megabytes. So that's exactly the same spot uh, where originally an x86 would boot off. That's exactly that spot in flash that we can now boot off. So all we have to do is put our own code there. We connected a standard old mod chip for an old Xbox before the fix, um, put our code in there, and wrote code that dumped it to some slower bus, and we had the new secret ROM. OK, we saw there was a new t-hash. There was a new key, OK, but there was also the t-hash. Um, digging around in some scientific publications, this means that each T key has three other equivalent keys. In particular, it is easy to construct collisions for T when used in Davis-Meyer hashing mode. So T cannot be used as a hash either. 
it is insecure. And look at who wrote that, um, who co-authored that. And it was in 1996. That was um, that was six years before Microsoft used T. So they should have read the documentation or should have read something. So we could change some jump to jump to our code. Um, let's look at the other hacks. We verified whether they still work, the missed hack. When the secret ROM went away, then Flash would be there on the old Xbox. They fixed that. Um, now, if secret ROM goes away, there's nothing below. Nothing will be mapped there. And how, whatever way we use to turn off the secret ROM, um, we will never be running again. The system will just crash. So they fixed that. They didn't know about our hack. They fixed that themselves. They found that themselves. And there is still the visor vulnerability, the visor backdoor with a wraparound. We also checked that. And it turned out that Microsoft acted too quickly. They didn't know about the visor hack. They didn't know that there was a problem. If they had waited for two months or they had checked their security system once again, they would have found out. Um, yeah, so. Uh, f just fixing it um, wasn't the solution. Waiting or a code audit, that would have been the solution. So we had no need to hack T. We just could use the old visor wraparound trick. So that wraparound trick would run on all Xboxes, and we could have a single ROM that ran on all machines. So uh, Microsoft never trashed Southbridge chips again. NVIDIA was happy about that. And even the latest revision, uh, well, the latest re revision now has a real ROM chip. But um, yeah, it's integrated into some chip. They, they did some things right now. But the LPC override is still there, because the Southbridge is still the same. And the Southbridge um, has this override functionality in it. They never trashed Southbridges again. So you can still connect mod chips, even on the latest Xbox. Um, yeah, that was the hardware attacks. Now I'm continuing with the non-hardware attacks. There were also some for those people who didn't want to open their Xboxes. There is another check from Windows to the game. We have hacked the first part, and now let's look at the second check. Um, yeah, it looks pretty secure. It's RSA public key cryptography. Um, there's nothing to do there. But games have data, and data Data might not be so secure. There may be some vulnerabilities there. And it is not checked, and sometimes it cannot check. So we checked um, standard buffer, buffer exploit methods. So what do games load? Um, typically from DVD, they load graphics, audio, video, all that stuff. But um, we cannot hack that because we cannot alter them. We cannot, we cannot burn a DVD again that will be accepted by the Xbox. So that's not a possibility. Safe games is a good idea because safe games cannot be um, hashed or signed or anything because they are written by that very software. And they are stored on hard disk or even USB storage. All the memory cards on the Xbox are USB. Um, USB devices, USB storage devices. So WG Lee from Switzerland tried all the games he had or all the games he could get uh, for rent alphabetically. And what's the first game on the alphabet? 007. <laughs> and whoa, 007 had a vulnerability in the safe game handler. So everything that someone had to do was DD a hacked game on a USB stick. Copying is not enough. You had to, it's, um, it's its own file system. Yeah? So I actually worked on that game. Huh? And I, I worked on that game. And I know the guys wrote the code. Oh. And the irony was, they were all the guys who wrote the code. And the irony was, the buffer overrun was in a function called save, save string copy. I <laughs> 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 it a second time, it wasn't a save string copy. <laughs> Oh, you have to introduce me to that. <laughs> we'll talk later. I know some people who would like to meet him. Um, OK, so, so everything that had to be done was too bad we didn't have the source code, or else we, we would also have, the have had the possibility to laugh. Um, yeah, um, someone has, just has to load the safe game of some USB stick, and that's it. And that's not the only game. There are lots of games. And there are several more that we haven't published. Lots of vulnerabilities. So you can just run Linux. Yeah? So you're telling me that, that 007 is my boot, boot disk? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 007 is your boot disk. Um, you can run Linux off 007 by just loading a safe game. You can call that safe game run Linux. 
<laughs> 007 is a nice bootloader. Uh, but how can, and the game is of no use otherwise. No offense to your friend, but the game sucks. <laughs> Um, but how is that possible? Um, we should be in user mode. It's just, just a, a, data, a user mode, a data exploit. But all games are in kernel mode and we have full control. But why did they do kernel mode? Um, that makes little sense to me, possibly speed or something. Um, but there is a problem. Using um, 007 as a bootloader, um, so you need the game, you have to buy it, you cannot rent it. You have to run the game every time. You have to, walk, uh, you, you have to look at that um, video at the beginning. But there is an application on the hard disk. This is the Xbox dashboard. You can manage your safe games, you can listen to music, um, change your settings. This thing is always stored on the hard disk and it also loads some data. And we could change that data by connecting the hard disk to a PC or something. So what it does, it loads audio files, there are 3D meshes, there are fonts that it loads. But it checksums, of course, audio, 3D meshes. <laughs> it does not check fonts and there is a vulnerability in the font handler, naturally. So what, Stefan Esser was the guy who found that, German security expert. Um, and Jeff Mears actually implemented uh, this hack then. So when the dashboard loads, it loads our hacked fonts, the dashboard crashes, our code runs, our code can then load the dashboard again and patch it in memory so that some keys are replaced, that our public key is in there so that we can sign um, and some menu entries are perhaps changed and we can run the dashboard again. I have a video here that shows, oh, not too loud. This is an Xbox booting up with a Mac Assault game in the DVD tray. The game is starting up right now, showing a small video, showing some animation. The game is loading right now. Uh, we have already attached a USB stick and copied the save game onto the hard disk. The game is loading. You'll see the title screen now. We say we load a save game. Install Linux is the name of the save game. <laughs> and now the exploit inside that Mac, in, uh, Mac Assault save game has uh, has started and that is now our code running. Actually, it's Microsoft's update code. With that game, that ships an update application which updates the dashboard on hard disk and we, we are in charge of the system. We loaded this update application, patched it to copy our data on it and now we're getting an update with Linux. Takes a minute. It's finished. It will eject the DVD and reboot. Now that's the boot up animation of the Xbox again. Now we'll start off hard disk. The hard disk is now spinning up. When, my, when you see Microsoft, that means the RSA check was okay. Now the dashboard has just crashed. It's reloaded again. And now you have <laughs> Linux there. <laughs> If you have 20 more seconds when the music stops, then you can see how to boot Linux. The idea was there was another menu entry that said Xbox Live, which is their online service, and we replaced, we replaced that one because using Linux and Xbox Live at the same time makes no sense because if you're on Xbox Live, they can verify what you have on your hard disk anyway. So Xbox Live and Linux will never match. Yeah. So we just installed Linux. Yeah? So with Linux, you obviously had to have Linux, the data somewhere. Was that already on the hard drive? And um, that that, that patched there? installer also copied a small Linux image, a really tiny Linux image. It was just some, I think, five megabytes Linux image or something. Off of the safe game. Off of the safe game. It was stored inside the safe game. Xbox safe games are actually just a folder with anything. You could put anything there. And we just used the NT kernel to file copy the data on there. And our um, bootloader also can uh, use the NT kernel to, to load the data and all that. Uh, but people can, of course, install a real Linux then. And if there's another Linux, it will prefer the full installation. So here's a better screenshot of that again. So what people had to do was just DD to, to use B sticks, load the save game, the hacked false will be installed. And every time you turn on the Xbox, the hacked dashboard will run and Linux will work. Um, 
the interesting thing about that is that there was a chain of many, many mistakes and any point of these could have made it impossible or at, uh, or at least very, very hard for us to hack it. They used USB storage for memory cards. That's, that was easy. That made everything so easy. Games run in kernel mode. If they hadn't done that, it would have been not so easy, maybe even impossible to do that. There was a game exploit. Yeah, you can never avoid that um, other than I don't know. Um, there was no font checksum. There was also a font exploit. All these contributed to that this worked. So, so many bugs. Uh, and of course, if there hadn't been the dashboard bug, there would have been another one in the dashboard with a music playlist, not just the font one. Then Microsoft fixed it, fixed it again. And Microsoft did it the same way as they always fix things, or as they had fixed things in the past. Um, they ship a fixed version of the dashboard. They even um, shipped it over Xbox Live, and new Xbox versions had that dashboard. But what we could do was just downgrade to the old dashboard, which would still work if you have a copy of that. Then Microsoft blacklisted that old dashboard in their newer Xbox kernels with newer hardware. Um, but there was another executable on hard disk um, that had the same exploit. We just copied that one back. That wasn't blacklisted. Then they blacklisted it. <laughs> then we used yet another executable, dash update.xpe, which comes with every Xbox Live game DVD, because the first Xbox is shipped without Xbox Live, and then, then they had this, this update, so that was the same executable with the same font bug, and there were plenty of games out there, and it wasn't blacklisted, and they cannot blacklist this one, because all games have to work on all Xboxes. So the hackers have won. So still today, on any Xbox you can find, you can permanently mod them to run anything and still dual boot into games. And you don't have to open it. If you open it, that's also fine. Then you can replace the hard disk. Um, this, this, uh, it, it looks like this when you modify more than one Xbox at a time. This is something we, um, I did for a hotel in Munich. They have one Xbox for every room. Um, with Linux on it uh, to show video content. <laughs> They're cheap, 150 bucks. <laughs> okay, le let me summarize. Um, let me look at the clock. Okay, I don't have too much time. I'll run through this. Um, the 17 classes of mistakes they have made. Eight design mistakes, six implementation mistakes, and three policy mistakes. Let me just summarize them again. And uh, I want to remind you that these are classes of mistakes, not individual mistakes. Several mistakes have been made more than once, and other mistakes are a combination, or what they did have, was a combination of multiple mistakes. Design mistakes. Um, there's no such thing as more secure or less secure. Either secure is effective or it isn't, and there is no sensible compromise. You do want to spend money on security um, to avoid losses if you don't have an effective security system. In-system programming of Flash, that was because of money, made the system insecure. Cheap and faulty ROM chips made the system insecure because of the extra init virtual machine that they had. The secret ROM in Southbridge, if they had put it into a CPU, uh, we wouldn't have been able to sniff it. Um, they did never, never did a second Southbridge update. That would have made it secure afterwards. Also, don't trade security for speed, because something like 10% faster um, doesn't make much sense if it is less secure, because there is no such thing as less secure, it's just insecure. Um, and 10%, that's not worth it. If it's 200%, yes, but in this case, that all games run in kernel mode, it's, it's not worth it. Also, be aware of a combination of weaknesses. Don't think of one single weakness, whether it can be exploited. Think of combinations. That's what they didn't do. Um, Adding extra barriers might not make sense. Um, better fix each individual component as well. For example, who would have thought that with a 007 game and the dashboard exploit or some other game in the dashboard exploit, you could effectively, and with user mode and all that, effectively run Linux. Also, never underestimate uh, the resources of hackers. There are commercial hackers and they have money. They want to spend money on making mod chips. Um, but, um, they are not that good. Um, those people, the hobbyists that have access to hardware from work or from university are even better. For example, Bunny at MIT, he had lots of resources there. Um, and never think that it would be too expensive or too much work to hack something. Um, 
I know someone who knows someone who did that, um, who had the idea of putting it in the South Bridge, so it uh, went over um, the hypertransport bus, and I know that Microsoft really thought nobody would be able to sniff that. That's just too expensive to sniff. So think about barriers and obstacles. Never make something harder for hackers. You must make it impossible for hackers because time is not an issue or there are just so many monkeys typing Shakespeare. Um, obstacles never slow down anything. And if you have many, many obstacles there, you might think that's a psychological thing, that your security system is stronger, but it isn't. Instead, use, this, uh, use these resources into um, real barriers. Um, safe games must be signed. It made no sense because anyone can sign safe games with the games can. Uh, the hard disk is password protected, but you can hot swap it into a PC while both systems are running, so it didn't make a difference. Um, the secret ROM was hidden, but um, hiding it wasn't the point. The hash would have been the point. And the games are not readable in a PC drive. Also made little sense because you also could hot swap the DVD drive. Then, don't use one security system against all attackers because hackers with different goals will unite. There were four different hacker groups with four different interests. The Linux people, the, the hacking, um, the, the piracy people, um, the homebrew people, and um, you, you must find out who your enemies are and you have to uh, handle them separately. Otherwise, either directly or indirectly, they will work together. In our case, the Linux, the homebrew and the copy guys worked together indirectly by just publishing their results and working on what others had already done. Security by obscurity does not work, that's obvious, but Microsoft did it. And of course, something like RSA or SHA works if used correctly. Um, hiding the secret ROM was obscurity, encrypting flash contents, um, hide DVD contents, that's all obscurity and it didn't have any effect. And, but they thought it would make it more secure, it didn't. When you are dealing with hardware, with software you can f roll out fixes every day, but not with hardware. With hardware it's expensive to roll out fixes, so you don't want to do quick fixes. You, those fixes may be flawed. Um, more holes tend to be found soon after one hole is found, so f either wait or audit the complete system. Um, because you have new knowledge, maybe you find more. And look what the others do. With the secret ROM hash function, they should have waited, and also with the dashboard, they should have thought a bit before fixing. Then there were several implementation mistakes. Do read data sheets. Microsoft do didn't do that. They didn't want to do that. Don't hack around, assume anything. Um, and especially be careful with components with legacy functionality like A20 gate. That is documented. It is in the data sheets and it's legacy stuff. And also the wraparound. It's also legacy stuff, but it is well documented. Um, now this sounds all so obvious, but that's mistakes they have made. Do read standard literature. For crypto, that's Schneier. For operating system, that's Tannenbaum. Um, Wikipedia is a good start. Not the article, but the references that you have there. Okay, Wikipedia wasn't um, available back then. Um, RC4 as a hash was a bad idea. They should have read the, um, all the data that is out, out there just as well with T. Get experienced professionals. Um, they must have a background in security systems. I know that some people from the web, web, TV, TV, uh, web TV team of Microsoft worked on the Xbox and they had no security background. They did a set-top box. It didn't have a security system. Um, and also don't get students. There may be good students, but you want to get pros with, man, with lots of experience. And the implementation of the secret ROM was just so bad. These were not pro people. Um, also make sure that your code catches all cases, because if it doesn't, then it will have the exact opposite effect by giving hints to attackers. And this happened twice. The secret ROM turn off check which was just too specific, which gave us the hint where to look. We didn't know what this, this instruction meant. We understood it by, by seeing that code. And um, ha hashing everything but the fonts gives us a clue where to look. Also look for leftovers. Um, look, we have to look at the final pr uh, product from the perspective of a hacker and hack stump and disassemble the final system. 
if you look at the old version of the secret ROM, which is still linked into the flash image. And also have a final test on your hardware when the final components are in place, because even every small ch uh, change can break everything, including security. The AMD to Intel switch was one su such thing, and the switch from RC5 to RC4. They couldn't just leave everything else in place. They should have changed everything significantly. And there's three more policy mistakes. One thing is you have to keep your source code secure or safe so that nobody can see it because the source code leaked of the Xbox. It leaked after the hacks had been done, but still you want to make sure that the source code doesn't leak. So you have to find engineers that you can trust. But this does not mean that you don't want as many people as possible have a look at your source code. It's important that many people have a look at the source code because um, obviously um, it wasn't many people that looked at the security code of the Xbox. You just have to find people you can trust. Uh, yeah, weak QA on many, many more parts. And you have to talk to your enemy because there is no such thing as an enemy. And not talking to terrorists is stupid. These enemies, the Xbox people um, or the homebrew people, they want, they have their goals. You have their, you have your goals, and. Um, Compromises are a good thing. There would have been the possibility for Microsoft and the hackers to find good compromises, but Microsoft was unwilling to talk, so the worst case happened. They didn't talk about 007, they didn't talk about the font exploit. Okay, so um, this was a short summary of the, the Xbox security system. Um, there's lots of more to talk about, and there is one paper that has more details in there, um, which is available on the internet, on xbox-linux.org, or, well, do it your way. Thank you. I don't know whether we have uh, time for questions, but anyway, I'll start Can answering. Can you this talk at Microsoft? <laughs> I'm sorry? They're <laughs> just down the block. Uh, <laughs> I knew uh, an employee of Microsoft and he tried to convince the managers to invite me there, but he had no luck. But I have given um, a similar talk before and it's on Google Video already, so Microsoft has the chance to, to look at that. Yeah. So um, what about the Xbox 360? <laughs> Um, I can only refer you to a talk that will be given um, between December 27th and 30th, I don't know the exact date, at the Chaos Communication Congress in Berlin uh, by a friend of mine, and I guess there are some new things about that. The current official state is that there is nothing to do there yet, because the 360 security is very, very good. Um, it's out for a year now, and there hasn't been a major hack yet. You can run copied games, okay, there was one flaw in the security system, but you cannot, hack, uh, cannot run Linux or anything. They, they implemented a hypervisor, encrypted memory, encrypted per box, encrypted uh, flash chips. That's a pretty good architecture.